Well, our main objective for this project is uh, we're looking at burbot movements throughout the year. Um, we're uh, trying to see what they do in the summer. Not a lot of known is about the burbot. So we're trying to look at uh, what they do in the summer, what they do in the winter, um, what they do after the spawn, because right now they're pretty fun fish to catch and pretty easy to catch. The Department of Natural Resources has partnered with Bemidji State University. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us. We had a, a, an opportunity to pull some equipment together to try to do some research such as this uh, on a species that oftentimes is not given much attention in lieu of other priority species like walleye and northern pike and bass. What we're seeing is a, an increase in the amount of interest from anglers, realizing that there's value in them as a recreational target, but also as a, a table fare. They're very, very strong fish. Um, the muscle structure in these fish puts up a good fight and trying to handle one with your hands is not the easiest thing to do. And they're becoming a very popular species in this state. Uh, right now we got these uh, acoustic tags from Vemco and we are implanting them surgically um, into the abdominal region of these burbot. Um, these tags will give us detailed movement of where these are at, um, given a set of receivers that are placed throughout the system. So these tags will set off a ping every 18 minutes um, or every six minutes, depending on which tag we use for each individual fish. And that'll give us the uh, exact location from the receivers of where these fish are at any point in the year. As long as they can be picked up by the receivers, we will know where those fish are at. They do have pressure and depth indicators on them. So every other ping that this tag sends off will record uh, the depth and um, where they're at in the water column. And then we're also uh, floy tagging, or a little T tag that goes in the, uh, in the back of the fish. Uh, one, to try to let anglers know if they catch a tagged fish, uh, that there could be an acoustic tag in it, and it might uh, help us out if they put that fish back in the lake. But also we are looking to see uh, what we might find for population numbers. And uh, it also gives us a lot of good information on uh, uh, annual growth uh, to see what these fish are doing each year. Right now we're planning to have this research uh, go from whenever we get these tags in this month and they're good for 14 months. So we'll get a year, year's worth of data plus an extra spawning season, which is going to be very important for our study to look at, uh, do these fish come back to the same areas and spawn or do they go to a different area to spawn the following season? They are, uh, they're aggressive fish, they're fun to catch and you can go out and catch a lot of fish if you get on the right spot right now. We ended up tagging 66 fish. Um, we spread the tags out throughout the whole lake to eliminate collision within our acoustic array. We also wanted to spread them out to see if there was movement between basins. Um, the lake is a long four mile skinny lake and I separated it in thirds, kind of geographical barriers of an island with a shallow spot, um, a narrow pinch point on the south. And I wanted to spread the tags out evenly within each basin. So the goal was 22 tags in each basin, we got 21 in the north, 25 in the middle, then 20 in the south. And I wanted to spread those out in each basin and preferably in a male and female to see if there's differences in movements between each sex and fish from those basins. Um, some of my own goals that I wanted to look at were dial movements. Um, it is what these fish actually cover over that 12 or 24 hours, depending on how you uh, merge them together and it's vertical in the water column. Do they come up, do they go down? When do they come up and when do they go down is a big key to that. Um, most fish you see that during their spawning time or you see that during times of feeding because they're coming up for a certain reason or they're going down for a certain reason. Some fish you see that dial movement, um, specifically muskies, when it's low light versus high sun. Um, when it's dusk you see muskies pull up or if it's cloudy, you see muskies pull up into shallow water. And then when it's bright, they go back down. Um, they can do that over a 24 hour period. They can do that over a 10 minute period if they want. If we got rolling in clouds, they might come up and feed. Um, and I think these burbot did most of that during under ice periods. And I want to say that is because of a lot of light um, reference. Yes, they are spawning during that under ice period. Um, but I think they like to come up there at dark we didn't see a lot of that shallow movement during the day. So they're doing that dial movement specifically due to light conditions. Maybe it's feeding, maybe it's spawning, um, but we saw a lot of that vertical movement in the water column overnight. So from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m., 
they were up in that five meters or less. Once the sun came up, they dropped back down to 12 meters. And they do it over and over again every day until the ice came off. And then they started to not exhibit dial movement as drastic. They were still moving a couple meters up and down, but it wasn't the 10 meter swing like we were seeing under the ice. Well, to start when we got all our receivers in in April, um, that was the tail end of the spawning season there. We still caught a few fish that had um, spawn in them in the middle of April, which was cool to see. And during that time, we saw a lot of shallow water movement. Um, a lot of fish hung out for night periods in a foot of water or even less. Um, five feet of water too was very common. And we actually had one fish that spent 14 hours in less than two feet of water, which was really cool to see. Um, but we saw a lot of movement up and down in the water column. Some fish would hang out 12, 12 meters down, um, which is roughly your 50, 45 feet. And then by dusk, they would swim up to the shallow waters of 15 feet or less. And as that progressed into ice off, those fish really narrowed that movement down and would hang out in the nine to 11 meter range. They wouldn't go shallow too often, some fish did. But from the looks of it right now, most of the fish tend to prefer the nine meters of depth. Um, and that went on throughout the whole year. Um, as the season progressed, most fish kind of pinch down and they like to stay in one depth range. More than likely that's due to temperature. It's too warm on the surface, they don't like that. We definitely saw a lot more movement than I think some people expected. Um, most people think they come up and they spawn and then they go back down and bur burrow in the mud. But clearly they move a lot. Um, we did have one fish that's a really good fish we've been able to track all year. That fish was able to go down to 21 meters of depth when there was no oxygen down there. We're not sure how long it stayed down there. It was down there for an hour or so at least. Um, we don't know if it just goes down quick, finds food, comes back up. Why the heck it does that, we don't know yet. Um, but it seemed to do that quite a bit in July and into August. At random periods, we'd get a detection of this fish in 20 meters or more. And we know by our measurements that there's no oxygen down there. Um, there's one part or milligram per liter, which is for most fish, death. Like you, most fish cannot survive a long times at that. Um, that fish also went shallow at some point. Um, in May, it was up real shallow, started to drop down to deeper. But in August, sometimes it'd go up to four meters. Maybe that's a feeding movement. Um, maybe it just wanted to go up there and hang out. We don't know. Um, Hopefully it's a feeding movement and we can kind of see that detection was picked up in the middle of the basin in four meters. You could almost make the assumption that it was feeding on trout or feeding on a school of bait fish, which would be really cool to see. But to see these tag transmissions come in of one meter in depth, 0.5 meters in depth for extended periods of time, and then four hours later they were back deep, those are real transmissions that we were getting. Um, so to see that kind of movement is kind of cool. It's, you're, those fish are hanging out right under the ice. They're hanging out on someone's, under someone's dock, potentially. Um, why they're up there? Who knows, maybe they're spawning up there at that point and they spawn that shallow. Maybe that's a new tactic here for ice anglers in winter is during their spawning period, sit in 10 feet of water, like you might be walleye fishing early season and you're gonna catch a bunch of burbot. Who knows? There isn't much known about what is a hypoxic zone for burbot. Um, there was one study I found that 1971 or something like that, that claimed burbot threshold was three to one milligrams per liter of oxygen, which is extremely low compared to trout that need six, walleye that need your four and five is their danger zone. So I think they choose those deeper areas because they are capable of surviving in lower oxygen climates than most fish. I think they'd prefer to be in cooler water, low oxygenated rather than warmer water, low oxygenated because you do see lower oxygen levels on the surface because water gets so warm. It's not as bad as it is down low, um, but it still is poor. Uh, so those fish just, I think, prefer to be in cooler water that is down on the bottom. And even though it's lower oxygen, I think they can make it work. There was hypoxic water in the end of ice season. It's just like summer. Um, you get to the end of summer, it's poor oxygen down low just because there isn't any movement going on in the winter. Um, so those fish were coming up shallow and once that lake turned over in early May, we started to see a lot more readings of depth in that 15 meter range, which we saw a few of those in 
the under ice period, but they were a short lived dial movement down there and dial movement back up where once that ice turned off, a bulk of the detections were in that 15 to 11 meter range. Um, so I believe, yes, they did go down there because they were finally able to get back down to that area and there was more light in the upper area. So they wanted to be down in that darker zone. It was pretty much at the ice off period of May 2nd that we were starting to get those detections in deeper water more frequent. But each basin was unique. It was almost like three separate lakes. In the North Basin, we had warmer temps, less oxygen, and it was dirtier. Where in the Middle Basin, it was crystal clear almost all year. Um, oxygen was good down to like 15 meters compared to the 10 meters in the North. And then in the South Basin, it was kind of that middle ground. It was not as bad of oxygen as the North Basin, but it wasn't as good as the Middle Basin. Um, so it's almost like it's three separate lakes. And that's probably some people don't realize as an angler, you go out on a system and you're catching fish at this depth in this area, you go to the other spot, it might not be good enough habitat for those fish to live in. Um, so it's something to think about in the future as an angler, just if you're catching fish here, it might not work somewhere else because there might be other qualities in the water that aren't suitable for fish. Most fish seem to have stayed in the areas that they were caught in back in March or April. Um, but there have been a few fish that uh, were, uh, we caught back in March. We had this fish just the other week that was caught by an angler. Uh, we caught this fish down in the South Basin um, and it was caught in the North Basin. So it swam two miles all the way up the lake through deep water, through shallow points, over humps, through the islands to get to the North Basin. Um, so there is that kind of movement, but I don't think it's as drastic as we were maybe hoping for, you could say. My opinion in this specific system, burbot could be the top predator in this whole lake due to the numbers that are in there and the size they can get to. Um, no, they're not going to take down a or beat a 30 inch pike to a meal. I, I could see them easily taking out a yearling pike, a four inch pike, if it gets the opportunity to do it. Um, they got a big mouth, they can, they can fit some food in there. Um, and if they're like any other fish, pike will eat a pike too, bass will eat a bass. Burbot might even eat burbot, who knows. For, from my understanding of fishing for six weeks straight for burbot, um, our good depth range were 20 to 30 feet. Um, you can catch them deeper than that, but it's not as healthy for the fish to catch them out of that deep water. Um, we tried to keep them in that 20 foot range due to the health, and it seemed to work. We'd have nights where we'd catch 20 fish or 15 fish, maybe five one night towards the slow end of the spawn. Um, but that 24 foot range was probably our top area. Um, the trout and pout spoons that are famous for catching burbot um, were a staple for us as well. Um, you hit it on the bottom, you pull it up a foot. If you're marking a fish, you're more than likely going to catch it, in my opinion. Um, during that time of the year, they're aggressive. They want to eat, they want to spawn and get done with it and go back to their normal life. Um, but the 24 foot range, Find some sand, it doesn't necessarily have to be all sand. Scattered boulders were pretty good for us as well. When you get in more rocky structure, you risk losing hooks, um, but we were catching fish in there, but I'd say we had our best luck in those scattered boulder zones that had sand. Steep break, super steep break. You mostly can't even see your jig on the bottom because the depth is so skewed on your flasher. In my opinion, if you find a steep break that has scattered boulders and sand, that's probably your best luck for catching them.